The budget stalemate on Capitol Hill continues as the possibility of a government shutdown grows increasingly likely with the September 30th deadline approaching. Will a compromise emerge? Does this present the opportunity for conservatives to reset the way things are done on the Hill? Joining me now to discuss it is Congressman Michael Cloud. He serves on the House Appropriations Committee, and he also represents the 27th Congressional District of Texas. Congressman Cloud, welcome back to Washington Watch. Well, thank you. Good to be with you today. Well, give us the latest on the budget negotiations. Well, right now, the Rules Committee is meeting as we speak, and uh, the, the latest plan is we're going to try to pass a rule that would uh, allow four bills to come to the floor, uh, kind of in a first tranche. That would be uh, the DOD, Homeland Security, State and Foreign Ops, and, and the Ag Bill. Uh, and then as we pass those, we can probably hopefully build some momentum toward uh, passing the rest of them. So this is what we committed to do in January when we said we're not going to do the normal thing of passing a CR, passing another CR, kick it down the can so you get Christmas Eve or Christmas Eve Eve, and then pass a massive bloated Christmas tree omnibus spending bill. So uh, we're forcing the issue on making sure we follow an approach process uh, where we actually vote on uh, individual spending bills. And, and that's what you see happening right now. And that's an approach that I think a lot of uh, America is sympathetic with. Do you see momentum for that approach in the Republican caucus? I, I do. And, and, you know, there can be points of frustration, obviously, when what, what's happening right now in Congress is we're rewriting the muscle memory. So it's been a long time since Congress even attempted to try to act properly uh, and to act the way it was designed to act. And so it had become such a habit and a norm of doing what I just described, you know, kicking the can down the road, passing an omnibus bill, passing bills that no one reads and, and all of these sorts of things. And so, you know, we said, we said, we're going to do this differently in this term. We're going to be able to read bills in advance, which actually makes things difficult because then people read them and they, you know, have concerns or little tweaks they want to make. Uh, but this is how Congress is supposed to work. It's supposed to be a deliberative body. You're supposed to actually evaluate what you're what you're voting on before it comes to the yeah. floor. And so it makes it more difficult, but it's a better will be a better nation because of it. And of course, it is a deliberative body and it's supposed to be a deliberative process, but we do have a deadline of September 30th. Can sure. that deliberation take place in time to avoid a government shutdown? Well, we certainly do have a tight timeline, and that's yet to be seen. Uh, I, you know, I wish we could have condensed the calendar. We, we did have Biden, you know, for the first five months saying we're not going to negotiate on a debt ceiling and those kind of things. And then there's probably some things we could have done internally in the House to speed things up. I wish we were a little further along in the process, but... But we are where we are. We're trying to do it, it, it the right way. We're passing these approach bills. And uh, whether we make it by the 30th, I don't know. But we'll, we'll be working, uh, continue to work and get them as, done as quickly as we can. Now, you've talked a lot about the process there and kind of changing the muscle memory of Washington, D.C., but substantively, there are some spending issues in Washington, D.C. The U.S. is now $33 trillion in debt. We've added $1 trillion since June. Back in the second Bush administration, it was less than $4 trillion. So almost $30 trillion in about 20 years. Is that an issue that Congress is really confronting and taking seriously and hopefully will be addressed in this? this uh, new budget? Sure. And that's part of what's been a, whole, a, a part of this whole process. You know, we we set a goal of getting back to pre-COVID spending, you know, to leave our military where it's at because we need it to be there, take care of our vets. Uh, but, but, you know, our government, our federal government's grown about 30 to 40 percent in the last two to three years. That's astronomical. And, and so we're working to get as close as we can to getting back to pre-COVID sized government, uh, you know, the we, we're seeing massive inflation, families are having to deal with it. And, and you hear it and it almost sounds trite and cliche, but we continually ask the American family to budget, to watch their 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 P's and Q's and, you know, make sure that they're spending wisely. Uh, and, and it's time, far past time for the, for the government to do that as well. And so we're giving a, a good, honest effort at doing that. A number of members are, we're trying to get the most, uh, most conservative figures while giving uh, giving the people uh, a government that works efficiently. Now, one of the budget related issues is the border. The border chaos and migrant crisis continues. September is on pace to be a record month for border crossings. Now, you've said that the border crisis is by design. What do you mean by that? 
Yeah, you know, it's it, it you can tell if you just look at all the data, it Biden admin, Biden and his administration inherited a secure border. All they would have had to do is nothing. Yet they continue to put in policies in place that have that have created this chaos uh and when they saw they weren't working, they just pretended like it didn't exist. And yesterday's press conference was like a pure example of that. I, I was I was impressed by the reporter who asked how many is enough, because I think that was maybe the most honest question that I've heard regarding this, because uh, lately, the, you know, the press kind of act is still kind of acted with the pretending as if the, the Biden administration was trying to secure the border when we actually know that they are trying and aiding and abetting cartels and migrating people into our country and using taxpayer dollars to do it. Uh, and so I thought that was kind of refreshing in a sense. That was one of the most honest questions we've seen asked in quite a bit. Well, if this is by design, as you say, that implies they want this to happen. What does the administration stand to gain? I, you know, you could speculate on what their many objectives are, but I can tell you this, their goals for the United States are not the same that most people have. And, and so you can look at a number of different policy objectives where they're in a sense working to bring the U.S. down a notch because of their worldview, as opposed to letting America continue to lead and be strong, uh, to be strong here at home and strong on the world stage, to be that shining city on a hill. Uh, they just really have a different worldview. And so you're seeing that in policy after policy policy after policy. And, you know, I was in a, a event in my district last week and we were talking about the border and a lady came up to me after the event. She said, I'm sorry I had to leave when you mentioned the border because I was one of those kids. I was trafficked by the cartels at age three and by seven years old, they were selling her out uh, to to all the unspeakable atrocities at seven years old. And so you know, the Biden administration just passed a record for the most crossings in a month. And but each of those numbers isn't just a number on a spreadsheet. It's a life like that that's being affected. Now, you said that all the Biden administration had to do was nothing. But uh, both President Biden and White House spokeswoman Karine Jean-Pierre have implied that the problem of the border is really a Republican problem. Uh, here's President Biden. Let's play <laughs> clip two. Mega Republican in Congress and my predecessor spent four years gutting the immigration system under my predecessor. They continue to undermine our border security today, blocking bipartisan reform. And now here's Karine Jean-Pierre. As we know, and you've heard us say this many times before, we are dealing with a broken system. And no action was taken from Congress. And so what the president was able to do, he imposed consequences uh, for those who do not have the legal uh, basis to remain, and he has removed more than 250,000 individuals. This administration has done so uh, since May 12th. Congressman Cloud, what's your reaction to that? Well, I think the American people can see straight through that. Uh, the fact is, is that President Trump had the same walls to operate under as we have today, uh, and still he was able to do a, a much better job. Now, I'm all for improving legislation right now. We're working to get HR2 attached to any sort of spending measure that would go over to the Senate because we must secure our border. We're trying to close any sort of loophole. But right now we have an administration that's looking for every loophole to distort the true intentionality of, of securing our border. Uh, they are They are aiding and abetting cartels. I can't say it any clearer. Uh, you know, they're, they're profiting billions and billions of dollars uh, off of this. They can create, create an entire new industry, both uh, Central South America and across the globe with the cartels, but then even within the United States of transporting illegal migrants. And, uh, you know, I got a fat down on the airplane today and I was thinking, I couldn't help but think while I was getting that, like if I was coming into this country illegally, I would not be subject to this sort of uh, scrutiny. And, and, and we have a legal process. My wife's actually a legal immigrant. I was at her uh, her citizenship ceremony. There's a right way to do this, and we certainly welcome that. We're a welcoming country, but we've got to secure our border. Now, on a related note, the UN and World Health Organization tried to rubber stamp a pandemic declaration this week that includes plans for censoring health, quote unquote, misinformation, and calling for universal access to abortion. Now, 11 countries formally objected, and despite UN spin, this was a major setback for the globalists. But the Biden administration has shown an eagerness to cede U.S. power to unelected international bureaucrats. We saw a new 
New Mexico what happened when government leaders use public health powers to unilaterally call the shots. Do we really want to see that sort of power going to bodies like the World Health Organization that previously botched the pandemic response? Well, and that's exactly right, and, and you're right, this is connected. It's it's the same uh, worldview operating that's leaving us with open borders is operating here where they're willing to cede U.S. sovereignty to a global world power. Uh, and the Constitution doesn't leave room for that. The Constitution was actually given to us because they knew power likes to coalesce. Uh, and so we were given a Constitution that would ensure that power stays distributed because that's what's best for the people. Uh, and so the irony of this is, of course, we had the the WHO who did a horrible job during the pandemic, and now their solution to having done a horrible job during the pandemic is, oh, if only we had more power, we could have done a better job. And, you know, that's just the, the solution of big government kind of people. It's always a, uh, I, we can fix the crisis we created if we uh, had more power to create more, more crisis and to control the, the crisis. That's not the way to go here. And the way the Biden administration is going about this is with every other country, it's called a treaty, but for the United States, we're not going to call it a treaty because we know we'd have to go through the Senate on that and actually get votes on it. So he's trying to do an end around Congress. This is a, an unlawful approach, uh, and it's really the wrong thing to do, and the Constitution has no room for it. Congressman Cloud, I know that you have to go to a, another engagement, but we appreciate your time today and your uh, diligence on all these issues. Thanks so much. God bless you.